Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Market 5. I'm your co-host, Joel Elkanen, along with Brianna Valeski, and we have Tim Seymour on the line. He's the founder of Emerging Money. He's also the managing <laughs> partner of a hedge fund, that's Trio Gem Capital Management. Tim, how you doing this morning? Hey, Joel. How you doing? Hey, Brianna. Hey, welcome. Uh, we hear you're coming to the Motor City here. Uh, tell us about the event and what your role is going to be. Oh, yeah. Uh, I will not be the Motor City madman, but uh, looking forward <laughs> to getting to Detroit, which is a, a fantastic city, which is clearly on the rise. And uh, the Engage event um, put on by Main State Capital is, is a, you know, I think, a, again, a world-class uh, event. It's kind of one of its kind. It's, <clears throat> it's focused on, on students and uh, you know, the future leaders of our markets, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be there. I'm on a great panel. Uh, Bob Dole, uh, Bill Miller, a lot of great people, Stephanie Link from, from CNBC. So, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're excited to be there and excited to be in Detroit. Okay, looking forward to it as well. I hope to see you down there. Okay, so just, just moving on, to just talk about the macros a little bit. Uh, the Fed made their move last week, took out the word patient. Market didn't react the way people thought it was. Let's just, you know, talk Fed, interest rates, a little bit macro here. Uh, what's your outlook on the market? Yeah, and I was a little surprised even at the market's reaction and even the, the commentary that I was hearing across the, the board yesterday as, as the dollar you know, regained a bit of strength and people said, all right, here we go again. Uh, but I think after last week, really, what, what happens is the, the attention moves away from the Fed and it moves to other global central banks who are clearly throwing as much liquidity at, at global markets as they can. Uh, you combine that with the fact that I, I stand out there, and maybe it's a little easier to do that now, but I you know, heard a lot of uh, criticism, say, a month or two months ago, that I think Europe's actually getting better. Uh, and I think the, the recent data bears that out. So PMIs, private sector data over the last couple of days, the Eurozone PMIs yesterday, Germany especially, were, were fantastic. Um, they tell me, and if you listen to the ECB, who said this two weeks ago, that they actually upgraded their, uh, their second-half growth to 1.5%. To, to I think it's going to be closer to 2 um, but but if you look at the, what was you know clear you know data differential which favored the U.S. market over you know say the previous six to, to months to two years, um, I think that's changing, and, and I think uh, it's going to, to to change you know some of the path of the dollar. Um, although I still think the dollar can you know move back higher. I, I you know my my kind of trading call was 95 before 110 on the on the Dixie on the dollar index, and I, I you know so far that looks like it might play out, and and uh, what it means is that those things that were so battered by uh, the dollar, those securities, those, you know, those asset classes by the dollar strength, I think, you know, get, get a window, get a reprieve here uh, to outperform in the short to medium term. And so this is kind of a, you know, it's been, it's been a six-week trading view, and so far so good. Um, and that, that includes emerging markets. Obviously, the EM currencies have been uh, notably pushed around and, and uh, not ready to make an, an all-in call on EM, which is certainly an area of, of focus for me. But I, I do think... Uh, there's a chance to to continue to trade it from the long side here. Um, I think the uh, you know the rates environment in the U.S. is also. I'm a little shocked that people uh, yesterday, as we we got down to you know 186 on the 10 year, are ready to pile back into a move you know to press through 160 on the long end. I just don't I don't see that, um, and therefore I would be uh, playing towards. I think we're a bit range bound on rates in the U.S. Uh, I think the Fed is in a very difficult spot, uh, but I think you know credibility wise and also the process of normalization, if you really believe what they say, and they want you to do that, and, and I think they've largely lived up to uh, the faith that we're supposed to give to them that they're going to do what they say, is that you know, a move in June, uh, which many people don't think can happen, but I, I don't know that that has to be uh, as catastrophic as markets want to price in. I mean, if rates do go up, are they ever going to go up very much? Right. Well, um, clearly the... the uh, a 25 basis point move isn't going to change the calculus. Um, it's it's a question of if you think back to the Greenspan Fed, these were guys that didn't move uh, in you know one offs. It was you know it was largely you know trends that were you know one to two year trends. Um, it's, it's very it's very difficult to see how that can happen. And this is a very different Fed in terms of how they might approach uh, moving rates. And I think they've told you that. So. Um, it's all really about is the Fed out of bullets. I think that's the bigger issue. It's a systemic risk question. It's not a question of you know can we bear 25 basis points. Um, I, I think it, it, I think we can, um, and I think the, the rest of the world might be a little better than people think. 
again, if you believe that Greece doesn't blow up Europe, then I think Europe is in a better place. I don't. I think Greece continues to be a lot of noise, even though it's it's unfortunate it's not been taken off the, the front page. It's it's uh, still going to be an issue that investors deal with, and I think it's going to create buying opportunities. But but again, the Fed has to deal with all those dynamics. And right, agree. I don't I don't I don't see how rates can move that much. Okay, let's talk about the oil patch here. We did our oil special a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know, kind of the consensus was, you know, we weren't shooting higher, not quite uh, in the Barron's camp here of twenty dollar oil. But uh, I see one of the stocks that you're looking at is um, Exxon Mobil. So first, just talk about your your thesis on the crude oil market, and then uh, what you're looking at technically and fundamentally in Exxon Mobil (XOM). Yeah, well, I mean, part part of this may be that I. I you know, my thesis isn't entirely on crude. It's really more on Brent. So uh, I, I view that the, the world's blend, as opposed to the U.S. blend, which is crude, is in a much better, uh, you know, balance than, than, than we are here in the U.S. So clearly people are, are, are focused on supply issues on WTI and, and, uh, and crude. And those are ones that probably don't get better towards, uh, you know, through the third quarter, both based upon where a lot of producers have hedged. Everyone's been following rig counts, and as much as they've been contracting, you know, they hasn't taken any supply offline. In fact, it's you know we've seen uh, we've continued to see growth. So the the dynamics for for crude continue to look uh, challenging. Uh, I think I think Brent is a little different, and I'm going to continue to say that I think Brent bottomed. I think Brent bottomed in in, in mid January uh, around 46 bucks a barrel, and and I think you know you build a base here, which is some combination of that you know the the world's going to consume 94 million barrels of oil next year. Um, I don't believe that, you know, price is truth. I don't believe that supply is, uh, you know, going to be <clears throat> as robust. I think OPEX, uh, while they're, you know, maybe some are, are you less relevant, I, I think they, they, they are in a position when, when they want to, uh, to, take, to take swing capacity off the market. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the world is, is still... Uh, going to be you know pushing uh, commodity prices around, but it's it's part of a broader view, which could be another show. I think I think commodity prices have largely based. That's not a one day event. It's not a it's not a one month event, but it's been happening. It's been happening over the last three months. And so you know, how do you play oil companies? I, I, I you know, for me, the integrated names are are clearly a place where I think you can make a call that doesn't have to be a one day call, uh, a one month call. You can trade them. You can also invest through them. Exxon is is uh, obviously you know, one of the strongest balance sheets in the world. Uh, it's a company that's uh, both proven that they're aggressive in their say acquisition of, of XTO, but a company that uh, doesn't necessarily panic during a time like this and has seen multiple cycles where 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 oil has has gone through significant downtrends. Um, I think it's a company that if you look at both the chart. Uh, and the valuation, uh, you know, we, we got through kind of back to October 2013 lows uh, about 10 days ago, uh, around 84 bucks. I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, and I think that's a place where people that want to own Exxon for, uh, for the medium term should be owning a stock. It's not terribly cheap um, at, you know, 11, 11 and a half times, but the 3.3% dividend yield, uh, a company that, that clearly will weather this storm. You know, a lot of people looked at the, the Whiting Petroleum uh, issuance yesterday and said, oh, wow, you know, is, who else is going to be diluting shareholders and who else is really, uh, you know, next in the E&P space to, to, to hurt investors? Uh, and clearly, you know, Exxon's not that guy. People thought Exxon might have even been someone to go out and buy Whiting and be opportunistic during this time when they clearly can be, right? They, they, are, they are able to pick and choose uh, where they want to exploit the weakness here, not be exploited by it. Um, so... Great analysis of the oil and gas sector right now, especially focusing on Brent. Uh, Tim, last time you were on your show, we were talking about Alibaba, and you had you know, explained to us a little bit of how they're kind of changing Chinese culture as far as the shopping experience. What's your long and short-term outlook for Alibaba right now? Yeah, I, I, they, they are doing that. They are the, the largest by far. They are uh, still, to me, the, the golden goose. So it was a as an emerging markets investor, uh, what I mean by that is, you know, you, you, you tend to, you invest with the state, not against it. Uh, at least that has been the theme since uh, governments around the developing world in the last, say, eight years or so have been clawing back, uh, you know, national interest, national champion assets. So, you know, while, while Baba isn't uh, officially uh, a national champion company, it is a national champion company. So the, the regulatory pressure that people see 
if anything, I, I take the view that this is uh, uh, clearly the, the Internet space in China, um, while it's a place where the state's been heavily uh, and heavy-handed involved, uh, they have to clean it up. They have to make it more reputable. They have to make it to a place where you know, a number of the merchants uh, who were you know, either you know, listing fraudulent goods, et cetera, I mean, there's, there's a lot to clean up there, and I think people have misconstrued uh, the, the regulatory notice. Uh, I think if you look at what management continues to do, they, they have a long-term view. So they, they believe that the mobile category and, and expansion uh, is going to be something that's not a, a couple-year uh, you know, growth story, that it's, it's, you know, their, their growth will be drawn out more, even though there is some early-stage leapfrogging and everybody knows how big BABA is. Um, they will continue to grow at a, a significant rate just by the nature of, of the way the, the, you know, the consumer class is developing in China and how underpenetrated the Internet sector is. So, uh, I, I, you know, and again, if you look at the last numbers, is really between that and lockup, that was you know, plenty of stuff for people to shrill in the market about. It. And frankly, it's, you know, it's, an easy, it's an easy target, and there's a lot of people that have thought they sounded pretty smart knocking it down. Maybe they, maybe they were, right, if you think about where the stock has moved. But to, to be selling Baba at 84 bucks here, uh, I think, is not wise. Um, and I think it's a, it's a place where there's a reasonable valuation and there's a great long-term story. They continue to invest in their infrastructure. The Chinese New Year gave some seasonal factors that made these numbers uh, that just came out not look as impressive. Uh, that caught people off guard, and that was the reason the stock got sold. I'd love to get your take on another Chinese company, Baidu. Yeah, I, again, you know, to me, this is you know one of the the kind of the three horsemen in in China. If it's uh, Alibaba, Baidu, and I think Tencent, um, maybe the fourth horseman is is China Mobile, which is a, a different uh, animal, but one that I think its best days are ahead of it. But but it's not I'm also long, by the way. So. Uh, Baidu is, a, is you know, it's multi-channel mobile, um, PC. It, it's, it's clearly both between, you know, connecting users and information and, and being uh, in a similar position as Google to influence uh, both retail and advertising. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic lead position company. I think it's a well-run company. Um, it's not a China macro play, so this is another one of the misconceptions. And, and if China prints... Six and a half percent GDP uh, in next quarter, which some think they might. Uh, that's not a reason to sell Baidu. Um, <clears throat> I think they they continue to grow uh, in mobile at the same pace that we're seeing uh, mobile adoption take place in the U.S. So this is a case where again these guys kind of leapfrog uh, what took uh, you know, longer to play out here because it's actually happening globally. Um, so I think the stock is is actually pretty interesting here. I think 205 is a key level to watch on the stock. It, it seemed to have held that. Um, so if you're trading it, I mean, I think that's you trade it from from that level uh, as your as your downside and protect just below there. Uh, but I, I think it's a, it's a great place to own Baidu here. It's it struggled recently, but um, uh, therefore again, not a bad place to own it. Okay, let's just go to a few out of the issues that you're active in here. Um, Google or Google, I don't know which one you prefer to trade. Let's uh, see Google here uh, getting the uh, the CFO from Morgan Stanley. That gave a nice boost to the stock. Uh, what do you think here? Are we going to finally break above the upper end of this range, 578, and get into the 600 handle, or maybe a little bit too much too fast? Well, I don't. I, I, I definitely don't think it's it's – too much, too fast, and this is a stock that's really lagged the market. Um, if anything, you've got a kind of a reversion to the mean trade for, for this company, which means you own it um, because it's been under owned, and and I think uh, the bar was uh, has been pretty low. I think the change in the CFO may be more symbolic than than it is, you know, a, a major change in terms of their capital allocation process. But Google's highly criticized for for a lot of uh, random you know capex expenditures and. And, and things that people don't understand the long-term value to the company, and um, you know that's been that's been the argument. One of the things I said on Fast Money ten days ago, um, as we talked about Google, was that I, I thought that you know Google has a chance to have kind of a an Apple-style moment in in this year, in the way Apple did about a year, year and a half ago, with regards to capital allocation and 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 activism and people, you know, the the, vo- the voices becoming a lot louder that they need to return capital to shareholders. They're in a position where they could. Um, you know, so uh, the CFO change is something that could speak to that. Uh, I don't know that it will. Um, and you remember also Morgan Stanley in the, the recent round of, of stress tests and, and CCAR results was 
one of the more aggressive banks in, in how much <clears throat> they wanted to, to buy back and give capital back to investors. So if that's the mentality that she's bringing on board, it's, it's a very good news. Just, just rooting out some of the, the, uh, the insiders club in Silicon Valley will be seen as a positive. Um, that's, you know, again, been a big criticism of a lot of the big giant tech companies is, is that there's, um, a little too much insider, uh, kind of control, and, you know, maybe this is a change there. I, I would own Google here, yes, and I do own it. Okay, uh, let's just move on a couple other issues here of interest. Uh, <clears throat> Bank America. Now, this stock has been a slow mover here. Um, got some good news with the, uh, uh, with the stress test. Just hugging here the 15, 1560 level. Uh, what's your take <clears throat> here on shares of Bank America? Yeah, I, you know, I, look, I, I think the financials have, have uh, been saddled for a couple of years with the, the two primary issues, which are that they're, you know, they're, they're still have regulatory targets on their backs, and and we're in a world where the yield curve is is you know lack of of a slope is something that really hurts these guys. So you know, you want to see uh, net interest margins uh, increase. You want to see them put a lot of the regulatory noise behind them. Um, I think the uh, the ability to, um, to 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 have upside leverage to both an economy in the U.S. that that you know maybe could switch into the next higher gear, but as rates begin to go higher, clearly these guys will will benefit from it. Um, I think the wealth management businesses are, are you know, the wealth management business is a pretty interesting business for them that that also offers some 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 upside. Um, I think the in terms of you know loan books and deposits, et cetera, um, these guys are you know, continuing to be you know, right at the, the the head of the charts, and so uh, it's it's reasonable valuation amongst its peers. It's not offering the most value, but I think it's 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 uh, it's a stock that's part of a balanced portfolio here. So uh, I, I like financials. Uh, that's part of also a cyclical view of of this economy, which therefore I think you should own banks. I think a lot of the worst news is behind them on the regulatory stuff, but it's not gone. There's going to be headlines uh, to come. Tim, do you ever get involved in, like, these crazy stocks like lumber liquidators? I mean, tug of war going on between Whitney Tilson and the company here. Do you, do you just, like, these things, do they just, like, stay away, or do you try and take a flyer on them, maybe on the downside? I mean, I don't know how much you're prone to, char- uh, to short stocks, but any take on lumber liquidators? Um, I'll, I don't, I'm not involved in the name. Uh, I definitely short stocks, and I definitely short stocks that I think are either broken companies or, or expensive, or, or you know ones that uh, you know to me are you know make uh, a, a very good argument to, 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 to underperform relative to things I, I would prefer to own on the long side. Um, I think the the activism angle uh, is 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 certainly been a very popular. Uh, you know, on, on the, the bull case and the bear case over the last couple of years, you know, activism as a strategy and co-tailing uh, investors who are out there who are making, you know, significant claims in one direction or another has been something that that uh, has worked. Um, but uh, to me, uh, there's a lot of risk in a strategy like this. There's a lot of risk also in, in listening to one investor who's who's got an axe to grind and, and getting out there and, and really not having any uh, edge on information. So, um, you know, that, that's what I'd say about this story. It, it's not a name I'm involved in. It's not a name I, I feel the need to jump into. Um, and I think investors need to be real careful when they're co-tailing activists. I think activism from the long side has been a better place to play. It's been a better place to see a company that looks like it's, it's, it's undervalued. It's got a lot of cash on its balance sheet. Uh, management uh, could be criticized. There are powerful investors in, in the uh, institutional holdings profile, which you can check, and, and I think that's a better way to look at it. Great advice from Tim Seymour, a uh, hedge fund manager at Trio Gem Asset Management, as well as the founder of Emerging Money. Tim, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate you giving us a couple minutes of your time, and uh, maybe we'll see you in the Motor City this week. I, I hope so. Great time, <laughs> and, and uh, great to be on the show. So look forward to being on again. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Tim. Great guest. Enjoyed having you.